So chapter 13 is actually a really important chapter because we are going to look at mutations. So we've talked about what a normal gene is, and it encodes an RNA, and some of those RNAs are mRNAs, and they get translated to protein. But really where we want to go is what happens if there's a mutation in the DNA? Then that mutation gets copied into the RNA, and if it's an mRNA, it gets trans maybe translated into an, an, some kind of faulty protein. And so this is a big issue, you know, a big um, deal for genetics. So what are, what are the nature of the mutations? There's a lot of terminology. We're going to talk a little bit about transposons. We've talked about them a, a little bit in terms of repetitive DNA. Some of them come from something called transposons. So we'll talk about that a little bit and a little bit about DNA repair systems, which are pretty good but not perfect. You see here in the vignette for the chapter, this is Lou Gehrig. He's a baseball player who had uh, ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, and ALS is often referred to as Lou Gehrig's disease. So you'll get to read about him in the vignette. So mutations in the DNA are by definition genetic, because genetic means having to do with the genetic material. So if, you, if the change is in the genetic material in the DNA, it's, it's genetic. But not all mutations are heritable from one generation to the next in terms of sexual reproduction. So what you see here in this figure is a zebrafish. They could have used a human, but they used a zebrafish, which actually is a model organism. It's not one of our main six that we studied uh, in this course, but it is a model organism that is studied. Um, and this, this zebrafish has, of course, somatic cells, which divide by mitosis. Um, and then it has cells in the, um, in the germline, which actually the, the, um, the, organ, the uh, organs for the germline are actually a little bit higher up in a fish, but I guess that doesn't matter. Um, but in any case, um, in the germline, in the ovaries or testes, you have cells that go through meiosis. So you can have a mutation, a change in the DNA that happens in the somatic cells, and those would only pass that change to other daughter cells through mitosis. So in the top sort of branch of this drawing, you have, let's say you have a mutation in one cell in the skin, or any, any body cell, they're showing that in red, then when that cell divides, it would copy that mutation potentially, and you would have a group of skin cells or a group of body cells that have it, but it's not going to be passed to the next generation because those cells are not part of the sexual reproduction. On the bottom branch of this drawing, though, or of this diagram, if you have a mutation, because you'll remember that the DNA replicates right before um, meiosis, and most of your mutations are going to be associated with replication of the DNA, as you'll see in this chapter. Then if a mutation is in one of those gametes, then if, and this is a big if, if that particular gamete is the one that gets fertilized, then every cell in that, in that next organism, the organism that derives from that mutant gamete would have the mutation. So they're showing the mutation as a red dot inside the um, gonad. And then after um, fertilization, which they don't show the other fish, but there would be another fish involved. But after that gamete gets fertilized, then it grows up into a new zebrafish. And every cell in that zebrafish would carry that one, that mutation. So they're showing that fish sort of in pink, in a way, uh, to indicate that that mutation would be in every cell. But most of the other cells, most of the other gametes in the gonads aren't going to have that mutation. So most of your offspring would be just normal, which is shown 
on the um, on the bottom right, the normal looking zebrafish. So you can have a mutation in a somatic cell, which would really just affect that one individual. Um, you can have a mutation in the germline, which would affect um, only any individual that comes from fertilization of that gamete. So it depends a lot on what type of cell gets the mutation, how much of the organism is affected, and whether or not the next generation is going to carry that mutation. So one type of uh, mutation we would call, roughly speaking, this is an insertion mutation, but this is a not just a single base insertion, but um, an insertion of uh, could be considerable size, and sometimes we call them simple repeats. So expansion or contraction of simple repeats is a kind of mutation that happens in the DNA, and this happens this particular one happens, like I said, it's typically going to have something to do with replication, and in this case it is. So if you have a repeated segment of a chromosome, and in this case they're showing a trinucleotide repeat, CAG, 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 I'm just reading the bottom strand on the figure, and when the two strands separate for replication, it's possible that one or both of the strands can fold back on itself, and make a little hairpin. So even in the DNA that can happen. Um, and the hairpin then will sort of loop out and when replication occurs across that, so if let's say the pink strand in this picture um, becomes the template, if it loops out in this hairpin, then when the new strand is replicated across it, it is missing some of the repeats. So. So what's going to happen is, depending on if the strand, um, in this case, the strand loops out, one of the daughter chromosomes, one of the daughter, um, one of the um, sister chromatids will have an extra section compared to the other. So we say that either um, if the template folds back like this, then you get a contraction of the repeated segment on one of the chromosomes. If the if the newly synthesizing segment section folds out, you can get an expansion. But they can expand or decrease. They tend to expand during DNA replication. These kinds of things that happen, all right, again, it really only matters if it happens in a gamete prior to meiosis. But they do happen with enough frequency that it's possible that somebody, you know, I might have 20 repeats of this particular trinucleotide sequence, but it's possible that in my gamete there could be 30 repeats because of a, one of these little events happening during meiosis, uh, during the DNA replication preceding meiosis in any case, and that I could pass more repeats to my child than what I actually have. So that's kind of interesting. So I might have... Um, like I said, 20 repeats, my child could have 30. It would be pretty rare, but it happens enough, at least, that in the population of humans, there's different alleles, there's different lengths of these repeats that have, because they've expanded and contracted through this kind of replication event, that there's enough of these different repeats. That's, these are the kind of repeats that we use for the PCR testing that we call DNA fingerprinting, the identification of humans based on the length of their repeated segments on different locations on the chromosome. And there's a little animation from the text that goes along with that. All right, now some other kinds of mutations. So um, a simple repeat would be describing, a, you know, CAG, 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 CAG over and over again. Um, this kind of mutation is might be one that you've heard of, missense, nonsense, and silent. This is usually the terminology we teach you in freshman biology. So let's say you have a, a gene. In this case, it's going to have to be a gene. Um, a simple repeat doesn't have to be in a gene. 
But a missense, a nonsense, or a silent mutation, these are specifically associated to mutations in genes, in codons, within a gene. And so it would have to be um, something that, a mutation that happens that changes a codon. And so it would change the codon in the mRNA, and therefore it might or might not have an effect on the protein that comes from translation of that mRNA. So in the, on the far left, you see the wild type allele, and they're just showing you one codon, really. So in this gene, you have this sequence, TCA. When it gets copied in mRNA, it's UCA, which is the codon for serine, S-E-R. Now, if you have a mutation shown in red on letter A, that's a missense mutation. Um, because it changes the codon from TCA to TAA, so excuse me, TTA, which makes the mRNA UUA, and that's a different codon, that's leucine. So we would say there was a substitution, there's serine was the original, and leucine is the new uh, the amino acid that would be inserted in the, in the mutant allele, the mutant version of the protein. If this was position 12, then we would say serine, and then tw number 12, and then leucine. That would be a symbol for what that substitution was. I don't know what position this is. They don't show me the whole gene. On part B, a nonsense mutation would also be um, a, chain, a mutation in the DNA. Again, a single nucleotide change. But in this one, it would have to be a particular way. If it went to TAA, then that gets copied in the mRNA as UAA, and that's a stop codon. So if you have an amino acid codon that gets changed by mutation to a stop codon, you have a serine in the normal protein, but in the, in the mutant protein, it, you have a stop. We call that a premature stop. So the, the protein stops translation before it really should have then that's called nonsense. All right, nonsense. And I, I, I usually think of the word NO, no more protein after that, because the protein stops. And then, so that's how I remember nonsense, NO, or that's how I remembered it when I was a student. And then silent mutation is the same concept. It's a change in the DNA. It does change the codon, but if it happens to end up being the same amino acid for that other for that codon, then it's called silent. So there is a change in the DNA, but there's no change in the protein, so it's still a serine. That's called a silent mutation. So all three of these terms refer to a change in the DNA, but really they're referring to what the eventual effect on the protein product is. So that's how those are referred to. All right, we also have some terminology that refers to the, what, how the change in the DNA occurs in terms of the DNA itself. So we, uh, a base substitution, which the last few examples I showed you, those were all base substitutions. But they can be classified not only as missense, nonsense, or silent, but they can also be classified as transitions or transversions. And this terminology has to do with what the nature of the change is in the DNA level. So not, not worrying about the effect on the protein. So if a purine base is the normal allele and then gets changed to a different purine base, that's a transition. If a pyrimidine base gets changed to a pyrimidine base, that's a transition. On the other hand, a transversion would be if a purine gets changed to a pyrimidine or a pyrimidine gets changed to a purine. So here's where you really need to know which ones are your purines. A and G are purines. And which ones are pyrimidines, C and T. All right, so let's go back and look at the last slide. Uh, on letter A, the one that we classified as a missense, I'm just going to look at the top strand. On the normal allele, let me get my pen. On the normal allele, the middle position is a C. 
on letter A, the mutant allele has a T. So that's a C to T change. And C is a pyrimidine and T is a pyrimidine. So it's a pyrimidine to pyrimidine change. So it's that part of the um, change would be called a transition. So A is a transition. On B, you have you still have C as the normal. So this is this is for A. On part B, C is normal, but it gets changed to an A. So that could be called C is a pyrimidine, A is a purine, so that's a transversion on part B. And then on part C, they're looking at the third position. On the normal allele, it's an A. On the mutant allele, it's a G. As long as you stick to the same strand, it, it, it will work out either way. I'll show you, because A to G, that would be a transition, because A and G are both purines. But I will tell you, if you look at the bottom strand, it would work. T is the normal, and C is the mutant on the bottom strand, so that's still a transition because C and T are both pyrimidines. So transition and transversion has to do with the change at the DNA level. That terminology describes the change at the DNA level, whereas missense, nonsense, and silent tells you what the effect of the change is at the protein level. So you can have a mutation that's a transition and also silent, or it can be a transversion and also nonsense. So these terms are not mutually exclusive because each term is describing a different aspect of the mutation. So transition transversion describes the aspect of what the actual change is between the normal allele and the mutant allele at the DNA level. Okay, so we have a couple of terms. One's, one's called the forward mutation. A forward mutation is just a general term that just means the, the original mutation. So everything we've talked about so far is a forward mutation, meaning you have a normal allele and then there's some kind of mutation and it becomes mutant. The DNA is changed. It doesn't matter what the effect is on the protein or on the phenotype. But a forward mutation changes, uh, is, a, is the original mutation that takes you from a normal to a mutant allele. So now, once you have a forward mutation, so in this example, let's say we have Drosophila that have red eyes. Red eyes is the normal allele. We call that wild type. And all the genes are normal. They're showing that as Gene A is normal, gene B is normal. This is a kind of a terrible notation that they're using here. But gene A is a different gene than gene B. I, I kind of wish they would show two alleles for A and two alleles for B. But I think they're trying to simplify it somewhat. So let's say you have some kind of forward mutation where A becomes mutant. So they're trying to show that with A minus. They're just saying that A, somehow allele A or somehow genotype A is mutant. B is still normal. So the A mutation is the forward mutation. And in this case, let's say it creates a change in phenotype. So now these flies have white eyes. So the forward mutation is the red allele to the white allele. They're both alleles of the same gene A. All right, so that's your forward mutation. Um, the forward mutation could be a transition or a transversion. It could be, it's not going to be silent. It could be a missense or a nonsense, for example. Obviously not silent. But in any case, once you have that mutation, all right, let's say we take a, f a group of flies with white eyes. This is how we would do it in the lab. And we expose them to some kind of mutagen. Could be x-rays, UV rays, um, let's say x-rays because they're more penetrating. So x-rays tend to cause mutations 
And so what you could do is then, what you would be doing is mutating the gametes of those flies. And when you mate those irradiated flies to each other, in the next generation, what you could find, you probably find a lot of flies that still have white eyes, but you could occasionally find a red-eyed fly. And that red-eyed fly, because all the parents had white eyes, and then we irradiated them to try to mutate that, what we could get is the occasional red-eyed fly. Now there's two ways that a fly could come up as red-eyed from white-eyed parents. Either you could have an exact reversal, so in the gamete, the A minus, whatever that mutation was, gets changed back to the original allele A plus. That could give you red-eyed flies, maybe just one or two. That would be called a reversion. But you cannot eliminate the possibility that when you're looking at a red-eyed fly that it actually has a, a mutation in a second gene meaning the original forward mutation in gene A is still there, but that the irradiation with x-rays has created a second mutation in another gene they're calling B, and that somehow the interaction of those two mutant alleles somehow, we say, suppresses the mutant phenotype, or we could say restores the wild-type phenotype. It's like, you ever heard two wrongs make a right? Two mutations make a red. Um, but it's the idea that, that the second mutation somehow um, makes up for the first mutation or somehow interacts in a way that creates a red-eyed fly. You would not be able to tell by looking at those red-eyed flies which ones are reversions and which ones are suppressions. But a reversion, if I told you that we knew it was an exact reversal of the A mutation, then that's, a rever that's the definition of reversion. A suppression means there's a second gene that also gets a mutation, so two mutations, somehow corrects and restores the wild-type phenotype. So it's a double mutant, but it looks normal. You wouldn't be able to tell the difference by looking, but that would be the definition of it. Now, if you have, so a suppression is a second site mutation. So you have a forward mutation initially. A suppression is a second mutation in another place that somehow corrects and restores the normal phenotype without correcting the genotype. In other words, it's a double mutant but it has a normal phenotype. The simplest example of what we call an intragenic, intra means within the same gene. So this would mean that the forward mutation and the suppression mutation happen in the same gene. This is just one example that they're giving you here. There's lots of ways this could happen, but any, any scenario that describes a forward mutation creating a mutant phenotype and then a second mutation in the same gene bringing the phenotype back to normal, that would be called an intragenic suppressor. The second mutation would be called intragenic suppressor mutation. They give you a pretty simple example of something that fits that definition right here. Let's say you have an, a, a, a normal allele that's TTA in the DNA, that's UUA in the RNA, and leucine. Then you have the forward mutation. It's a missense mutation right here. And the reason I know it's missense is it changes the codon to indicate phenylalanine. And by the way, it went from an A to a T. So it's not only a missense mutation because it changes the amino acid, but it's also a transversion because A is a purine and T is a pyrimidine. So different language to describe different aspects of the, of the whole scenario. And the whole thing could be called a forward mutation because any mutation that takes you from a normal to a mutant phenotype. So let's say, let's say this protein that they're showing here creates red eyes in the fly. 
then maybe this forward mutation creates the white eyes. Maybe this protein doesn't fold correctly, maybe it's an enzyme. For whatever reason, it creates white eyes. The reverse mutation, if you went back, if this, if in the next generation, in at least one of the offspring, T got changed back to A, that could be called a reversion, and you'd go back to red eyes and the DNA would be ex exactly normal. But if it's a suppression, then let's say that, the, that a different, and this is a different location, even though it's, it's in the same codon, but it's a different location. Let's say the first position of the codon got mutated because the T is still there at position, at this third position of the codon. But now the first position got changed to a C. It was a T, and now it got changed to a C. So that's a second mutation. It's technically a different site, but you're still in the same gene. And let's say that codon encodes leucine again, which you'll recall is, creates a red eye. So this is an example, this isn't the only example, but any, any scenario where there's two different mutations, but the second mutation somehow restores or corrects for the effect of the first mutation, at least in terms of phenotype, it's called an intragenic suppressor. All right, then you have something called an intergenic suppressor. That would be any scenario in which the second mutation is in a whole other gene. So the first mutation is in the first gene. It creates an unusual phenotype. And then the second mutation returns the phenotype to normal. But it, if that second mutation event is in a whole other gene, that's called an intergenic suppressor. So it's um, getting kind of picky. So in this example, let's say you have a first mutation. They don't even show me the original sequence in here. Uh, let's say you have a first mutation that changes this middle position to an A, if I'm looking at the top strand. And let's say that it, it was a codon for an amino acid, but when you change that to an A, it creates a stop codon. Because AUG is a stop codon. So by the way, if you had a normal codon that changes to a stop codon in the protein, that's called nonsense, remember? It's also a forward mutation, and they don't even tell you what the effect is on this, but some kind of mutant phenotype. But then what if, so that would be the forward mutation, it creates a mutant phenotype. What if you had a mutation at a second site, and this is a particular example, but it fits the, it fits the definition of intergenic suppressor. What if you had a mutation in a second gene that encoded the tRNA, and you remember how there's not supposed to be a tRNA that, encode, that matches up to a stop codon? But in this case, the mutation creates a tRNA that can recognize the stop codon then what would happen is the tRNA would be able to bring in some amino acid here, and it's probably not even the right amino acid, but it, sometimes that doesn't matter. And if, let's say you can, because that stop codon can now be recognized by a tRNA and an amino acid could be brought in, you might be able to get a full length protein in this case, because the first mutation created a stop codon, but the second mutation created a tRNA that could insert an amino acid in response to that stop codon. I mean, that's crazy, but the point is the general definition. The general definition is you have a mutation that creates a mutant phenotype at one site, and then in a different gene altogether, you have the second mutation, which restores the normal phenotype. Anything that fits that definition, any scenario that fits that is called an intergenic suppressor. So you end up with all these different types of mutations um, that we've talked about a little bit. Base substitution is where nucleotide in the DNA gets changed to a different nucleotide. And we're going to talk about ways that that can happen, but it doesn't matter in the end. No matter how it happens, um, that is called a base substitution. So in the end, the gene still has the same number of nucleotides in it. It's just that 
an A is changed to a G, or a T is changed to an A. So um, any of those would be called a base substitution. And like we said, some base substitutions can cause a missense, which changes, you know, a codon for leucine to be a codon for serine or some other amino acid. Some base substitutions can create a stop codon where there wasn't supposed to be a stop codon. Some base substitutions really don't do too much. It changes a codon, but it ends up being, we call it synonymous codon, meaning a codon that indicates the same amino acid. All right, because you'll remember that third base in each code on that third position is typically has what we call wobble. And so, for example, if there's a mutation in the third position of a code on, often that won't change which amino acid is inserted there. All right. You can also have something called neutral. Neutral is where the amino acid sequence changes, so it's basically a missense. But the change doesn't affect the protein's function. So like, let's say you have a hydrophobic amino acid and it gets, there's a missense mutation which causes another hydrophobic amino acid to be inserted there. Sometimes that won't affect the folding of the protein. So not only is it missense, it could also be called neutral, meaning it didn't, didn't cause any real phenotype. So a transition is where you have a purine an A or a G, swapped out for another purine, a G or an A, or pyrimidine, C or T, replaces another pyrimidine, T or C. Transversion goes the other way, purine swapped for a pyrimidine, or a pyrimidine swapped for a purine. An insertion would be an addition of one or more nucleotides, and a deletion would be a deletion of one or more nucleotides. And those would be... Um, they can be one, like it says, one or more. It can be one nucleotide, two, and then we looked at some that are, you know, could be 20 nucleotides if it's one of those little um, short tandem repeats that gets inserted or deleted. We talked about forward mutation, changes a wild type phenotype to a mutant. Reversion, reverse, was the exact, I don't like their definition here though. Reversion changes not only changes a mutant phenotype back to the wild type phenotype, but it corrects the DNA, the change in the DNA. It returns it back to a wild type DNA sequence. So I would add that. And then suppression is where the wild type phenotype, uh, excuse me, the mutant phenotype becomes a wild type phenotype but there's a second mutation. So there's a second mutation that corrects the phenotype caused by the first mutation. So a suppression is, is a double mutant, whereas a reversion corrects the forward mutation. Second mutation. So I'm not in love with his definitions here, but I think you guys got the point. If it's intragenic, the second mutation happened within the same gene. If it's intergenic, the second mutation is in a different gene. So that's the difference there. So then what's left? Frame shift. Frame shift is associated with an insertion or deletion, and it causes the codons to be read in a way that's not intended. We call that, it changes the reading frame of the codons. All right. Um, this one is not very important. In frame deletion or insertion. Uh, let's not worry about that one too much. Expanding nucleotide repeats. That's really just an, an ex, just a special type of insertion or deletion. Um, and then these couple down here. Loss of function, gain of function. These three down here, loss of function, gain of function, lethal, these can be used. Um, sometimes loss of function is called, uh, well, you can have a no function or you can have less function. Sometimes that's called hypomorphic. Um, but that if that's starting to get into how much the 
the mutant protein product can actually do its normal job. Because sometimes you have complete loss of function of the protein product. Sometimes you just have a protein that doesn't work quite as well. So this starts to get into degrees of this, but we're not going to worry about those. But the other ones, except for the ones I crossed out, um, I think you should have a good grip on what aspect of a mutation is each of these terms is looking at. Okay, the last little bit before we take a break is spontaneous mutation rates. So most mutation happens, we think, really um, at the replication, at the moment of replication. So we blame, write this down, we blame the replication process for most mutations. Most mutations are actually just mistakes, like two-thirds. There's been a fairly recent article that came out, some research that shows two-thirds of mutations, new mutations, happen because of errors of DNA polymerase. And you know that DNA polymerase can correct some of its own errors, but um, not, it's not 100%. So any mutation that's caused by the, the cells, the function of the cells themselves, the, the, the enzymes in the cells, just making a mistake occasionally, those are called spontaneous mutation rates. It doesn't matter how much uh, organic food you eat, how much sunscreen you wear. Spontaneous mutations are things inherent, just the error rate that's inherent to the enzymes themselves. And so... They try to measure the, the mutation rate, the spontaneous mutation rate for organisms. And what they found is that it's, it differs between organisms and it differs between even genes within the organisms. So that's a little confusing. But what we can say is that the spontaneous mutation rate is pretty low. And that's, we think, that the enzymes do a really good job of replicating, and then when they do make a mistake, they do a pretty good job of correcting it. And then, when they can't correct their own mistakes, there are additional repair systems that typically will come in and take care of it. So, in the end, um, even though replication is the source of most mutations, in the end, there aren't that many. There's enough to allow new alleles to appear over large amounts of evolutionary time, but not so many that the organism is um, hurt by enormous amounts of mutation in every generation, because that would be very destructive.